Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Well, it's always good to be in demand, isn't it, John Crispin? Great to have you back. <laughs> I'm, I'm in demand nowadays. This is good. I like that. <laughs> Come on. Like you've been in the, the last few days, you've been in a lot more demand, haven't you? <laughs> With yeah, everything going on. What? Everybody, everybody wants your take on things. I know. Oh, it's, no, it's I, unbelievable. I, I heard you with Childers and Newheisel, I think, yesterday or a couple of days ago. We were talking, we're kidding about being in demand. Uh, so. yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> I, um, so, I mean, just for very quickly, you know, it's, it's as, as Dick Girardi would say, yesterday's news, but, you know, it still was news nonetheless. In the end, uh, did the Big Ten handle it right postmortem? You know, I. I'm not, I'm not really sold that they did. I, I think the way I described it, as I said, I think the the punishment was reasonable but perceivably lenient, which sounds like such a like a diplomatic and and political way to say it. Um, yeah, when did you there, when did you turn that way on me? I was. I know I, we, we live in such a sensitive world that it's like if I say something that makes I too know. much sense, I'm going to just I'm going to create so many um, so many frenemies. You know yeah. what I mean? Where yeah. people that's in my face, they'll like me, but behind my back, they'll mean tweet. Oh, yeah. um, but, but the reality is, I don't think they took into consideration the fact that something similar happened last year. And that's the one thing that jumps out to me. Right. Um, I also think that the, the conference and schools fall victim to social media narrative because they, they rely on what's being said. To, to maybe justify what they want to do. Yeah. Uh, where they find enough people that say, well, Greg Gard, he did this, he instigated. And I'm saying, hang on a second. That thing he did happens every single game, whether you're happier or not. Right. Uh, touching someone on the arm, is that a threatening thing? Absolutely not. Let's not create a false narrative around instigating something that turned into a, a like a near brawl. Right. Uh, ultimately, it's the responsibility of Jawan Howard to not lose his mind. And this is the second time he's done it. Right. And and I felt like the first time it happened is one of those things again, you know, with Mark Turgeon that you say, that can't happen. Given the responsibility you have to represent your institution and represent these young men uh, in, in a way that you are a leader and you set the example. You know, I felt like that couldn't happen last year and here it happens again. Now, at the same time, I always say, look, I have a bias towards these people as human beings because we speak to them as human beings. You know, I have an empathetic perspective for them. Um, and that being said, like, I'm hopeful for them. I hope they do well. But you have to be able to separate your own perspective from the reality that is you don't respect the responsibility you have to lead this program. And if something like this continues, which it seems like it already has, I felt like it could have been the rest of the season. And, and quite frankly, it, it probably should have been, given the fact that this happened last year. Yeah, no. See, that was I pointed that out earlier in the week because of the Mark Turgeon incident last year. I felt this was the, this was the second time through for him, and that's why I had advocated that it had to be the regular season plus the Big Ten tournament. But that, well, that, Steve, but, think about this though. Like, think about this. Like, this is something like I've kind of dealt with this um, when I call American Athletic Games with yeah. Penny Hardaway. Yeah. You know, he he didn't do what someone else has had to do in terms of persevering, growing in the profession uh, the, the way most have to. And I think what, what that does is it establishes the expectation on you. So when you do get that job, you have adhered to an expectation all along, and that becomes the baseline, the foundation for expectation. Right. I don't think some of these guys who come from the NBA, and this is not a knock on them, anyway, it's just a reality. You know, it's not an excuse. It's just a reason. I just think if you're handed this job, there's a part of you that's still a player. And you can't believe that people are criticizing you. I mean, to this day, Penny Hardaway won't let me come to shoot around because I criticized them in November. I mean, that's what we're dealing with. Because you, you, know, because you analyze what was going on in November. Yes. I mean, okay. I, I, call, I okay. In other words, a 20-point loss. And right. then I said, look, this is a team that's disconnected. I, I hear about all this smoke. Well, you've got it. You've got to do something with it. And that leads to, well, how dare you take a shot at me? And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. If you coached and you were an assistant and you were around this, you'd understand that, that that's harmless and that's just the job. And the position you're in will always, you know, it'll always get some degree of criticism and it can't be something that's taken personal. I think part of it is Juwan Howard, because of who he is, still thinks of himself as Juwan Howard, a player. Right. 
and there's a pride, there's, there's an ego there that, you know, as you grow, you have to realize, like, I need, I need to put that aside because I represent something bigger than myself. The responsibility I have is, is far greater than just myself. Right. It's these other guys around me. And I think that's something that you learn as you grow in the profession. And I think it's hard for some of these guys who, frankly, like, you couldn't pay them enough money you know, in terms of what they think they're worth. I mean, these are guys that have made, you know, luckily $100 million in their careers. Sure. And you think $2.5 million is going to keep them in line? It's, it's, it's just different. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it, just, it requires a, a different approach from an athletic director and a different approach, approach from a commissioner standpoint in terms of Kevin Warren and the Big Ten. There have been fewer fouls called this season across the country than there were five years ago. It's about down two fouls a game from what I've seen. Yeah. But of course, in the Big Ten, I'm still seeing heavy physicality, and I have yeah. felt I have felt in the in the NCAA tournament when they get other officials that may be more of a quote finesse league, and you and I know it's yeah. called differently. I felt yeah. the Big Ten has been hurt by that because they can't adjust to the style of play out there. It does uniformity need to come from a central location for this, or should the conferences continue to do the the independent hiring they do do? I think the conferences should do the independent hiring. I just think we need to eliminate Big Brother from the process. I mean, what what's happening is these officials are all held accountable by different people, right? In the sense that they get grades. You know, some of these some of these guys get halftime grades. This is oh. what you miss. This is what you're doing wrong. I mean, who does well when someone, uh, some Big Brother, is watching everything you do it, and judging every call? And then, oh, by the it's, way, it's more if than you that. don't call this, you don't get NCAA tournament. It, by uh, the way, it's game. more. It's more than that, John. You and I both know because I mean we're around it all the time. Yep. That the worst thing they can do is go back to the locker room and the play is on the phone, yes. and they've got to look yes. at it. Yes, I mean it's it, it's not good, and it, and it, what it does is it it eliminates the instincts that officials develop over time calling basketball games. I trust their instincts more so than I trust the black and white letter of the law. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I said it in a broadcast where I said I, I, I quite frankly I was doing a game Sunday, and I said I, I wish the officials just wore gray shirts because that's how the games played. That's where the games won. It's mm-hmm. in the gray. Yeah. Where not everything is black and white. We want to look at everything and say, oh, could that be a flagrant foul? I'm like, look. It could be if you're literal to the the letter of the law, but the reality is that was in no way intended. It just happened. Let's not determine the outcome of a game on this literal interpretation of a silly rule, Mm -hmm. Uh, when in reality, you're letting so many things go physically that are actually handicapping the Big Ten. It, It truly is. It is holding the Big Ten back in terms of when you look at the teams in the Big Ten this year, and the potential, scoring potential that some of these teams have. And then you're seeing games in the 60s, and you're saying, what is going on? Right. Like, it's too physical. Whatever happened to freedom of movement? And, and, it's now and, gotten back to this hand-checking that, that we used to play with. Right, well, yeah, you play with hand-checking, but there were certain games, and they were non-conference games, where you, Joe, Titus could move. And that's yes. when you guys thrived Yep. Because it be- became a game of passing, cutting, and shooting. Yep. And to me, that, and, and to it me plays that, into space and all those things yes. that we want to do this year. Yeah, and, and to me, that's the best kind of basketball. Yes. Yeah, 100%. And the thing is, it's funny how they did that thing where they say, oh, freedom of movement, and it becomes a point of emphasis. And then that lasts a little while. Um, and they're like, well, scoring is up. Well, I'm like, well, scoring's up because foul shooting's up, but actually scoring's down. Because you're eliminating the flow from the game. You're right. eliminating rhythm. You're, you're, you're affecting the fluidity of basketball. And truth be told, the way the game's played today, you need to enhance fluidity. You need to enhance flow. And the Agreed. officiating Agreed. should... First off, I think the best way to do it, honestly, is to give them all six fouls and call fouls early so you establish the way the game is going to be called. I think once you do that, and then, then it's up to officials to be consistent thereon, I, you call a foul early. The NBA does it so well, where they call fouls early, and you're kind of like, mm, they're calling that today? Well, they establish the way the game's going to be called, and it's up to the players to adjust to the game. I think players have the ability to adjust to the game more than they get credit for, but the problem is it's hard to adjust to, to the rigidity that, that we have today, right? There is an inconsistency with what's called, and there's also an inconsistency with, with from game to game how the game's going to be played. And frankly, I I think it supports some of the inferior teams, teams that are saying, you know what, if the game's in the 65-70s, we lose. So let's make it super physical and slow. 
Well, that's not good for anybody, and that's why we keep talking about Big Ten teams not winning a national championship, because right. ultimately, teams that win a national championship, they got to outscore their opponent. Defense travels. Yeah, 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 whatever. Defense wins championships, yep. but you still have to outscore your opponent. Yep. And the teams that have won recently, including Virginia, yep. played, if you go back. Virginia played scored. offense. They, they, they're yep. a team they that offense. won went from the, hey, let's go 55, 56 possessions a game to let her fly. Yep. And that yep. see, offense in college football and offense in college basketball in recent years have been the ones that have been winning. Yes. And a defense, honestly, that supports your offense and an offense that supports what yeah. you want to do defensively. Right. I mean, like, like, you know, Joe, and, and I'm sure you've talked to Joe, my brother, uh, you know, at some point, and he talks a lot about what he's doing, and it's crazy. Right. You know, I think he just won 96 to 91 last night in the first round of their, their conference tournament. And part of you saying, that's crazy, but what you give up allows you to do what you want to do on the offensive end. So your defense supports your offense, your offense supports your defense, and what do you have there? Well, you have flow. There's a rhythm to the game, and ultimately you want to get the rhythm in, in a, the way you want it, right? That supports your game, your team. And I think it's hard to find rhythm in the game today, let alone establish it as a team. And I think that's going to hold the Big Ten back. It's going to hold back some of these yeah. really physical conferences because we've seen it in the Big 12 as well. Yeah. Well, let's, let's see. It's The officials, by the way, I have great respect for us, do you? Yes. Great respect. Yes. Really hard job. And I think it's the direction they're getting from their yes. respective leads in the conference offices that's that's causing how they're calling it. It's not a personal decision. No, and ultimately, you're talking about people making rules and points of emphasis who don't actually call games. They're not actually there. They, they don't really get in the flow. They, they get in the black and white of the game, and the reality is, like I always say, again, the game is played in, in one in, in, the in the gray. In the gray. And, and the, yes. it, this is what, uh, I'll give you an example where the game is played in the gray. The game is played in the gray with the, that little arm bar. The game is played yeah. in the gray where off a cut you would grab the jersey, right? Yep. Well, you can't, yep. see, you can't see the jersey. Okay, that's where it's being played. I th- I've always maintained, John, that you take the first two weeks of the season and you put it down as to how you're going to call it and you clean up stuff like that. You kind of use the first two weeks like the NFL or the NBA uses the preseason yeah. to then set precedent. That's how I've looked at it. Yeah, it's, and, and what's, getting, what's getting hard is the game is called one way in non-conference and it's called differently in conference exactly. play. Exactly. The other thing we're seeing, which is just a reality of, of, of just the human dynamics of things, is ultimately fans have affected officiating this year. And we've seen that because last year there were no fans. Uh, this year you can see the human side of it with officials. And, and I, again, like people say, oh, you're criticizing. No, I'm not. I'm, no, no, no. I'm pointing out the realities of being a human being. When you went from having no one in the stands at, and different levels of conversations with coaches to now – you feel the emotions of a game again. And I think there's been an adjustment period for officials, but also when you have someone leaning on your every call, I mean, what is that like? That's like a coach saying, don't miss this shot. Right. Like, well, what are you going to do? Now, now I'm trying too hard to make the shot. Well, when you say you, you need to get this call right, now you're looking for it. You're not, you're not officiating a game with instincts. Because I think the game, when it's officiated with instincts, what happens is – they call what they see, and they see what they feel. Right. And that's important. Like, yep. that tells me more truth about a game than anything else. Yep. But, but when we're told to call this so you look for this, there's an imbalance. It's funny. It's like we have a, we have a global issue, right, a societal issue, where we, we, we try to find balance with imbalance, mm-hmm. right? Like, something's out of balance, so what do we do? We apply imbalance to it to fix it, and it never fixes it. Right. It just causes a greater issue. I mean, that's universal, and, and ultimately it's a human dynamic. It's, a, it's part of the human condition. And, and that's playing out in basketball. The problem is, man, the value of basketball makes it even tougher to live with. Mm-hmm. The value to these kids, the value to these institutions, all we want is some consistency because yeah. with consistency we have growth. Right. Well, that's why, you know what separates the really good teams? The really good teams get separated because, guess what, they're rarely in the close games where the call makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. They're rarely in yeah. close games. Okay. In other words, you're winning the game by 10 to 15. Does it really matter how it got called? That's why they're yeah, never exactly. in those predicaments. Yes. And 
they're also adaptable teams by nature in the sense that, look, sure. I always give, I give these speeches and I always say things like, you know, the best teams don't win with set plays anymore. The best teams win with adjustments. Well, why is that? Well, look, we're in a fluid world. You know what I mean? Like, right. so, so you don't win a game based on running your set play and it actually works. You win a game by preparing yourself to adapt to the game and adjust to the game and counter what a team does. Feel the game out, make adjustments throughout. Like those are the teams that do well. But ultimately, you have to adjust yourself to the way the game's being called. The problem is, with five fouls, and Zach Eady gets one early, yeah. he's out of the game. Mm-hmm. He's out of the game. And now you completely change the team's entire rotation in terms of how they yep. operate. I just wish we went to six fouls where you can get away with one and you say, "Hey, this is what we're calling." It's up to the team now to adjust to it. But the rules we have in place right now, it, it doesn't really afford that opportunity. I've seen games lost where the on the two-foul thing, where they sit the guy yeah. down, and they go the rest of the half without him. And you're looking around. Game, and, game's and, over. And you know how many, how many games have you done, right? And we can compare notes here, where somebody really good got two fouls. Coach you know, may have taken him out for a little bit, but stuck him back into the first half and never got the third foul in the game. Yeah, but but also, but never played the same way either. Yeah, probably I mean, I not. Saw it, I saw it yeah, at probably Michigan. not. I saw it at Michigan with Purdue. Purdue was at Michigan. Yeah, Zach Eady got his first foul within like a minute and a half in the game. Yeah, and he goes out, and he doesn't really play. And now their entire their entire rotation is differently. And I remember telling Brian Custer, who was calling the game with us, said, "Yeah, this is not going to be good for Purdue because this is a completely different approach to the game where Trevion Williams is now the starter." And it changes your rotations. You're playing right. with different guys. You're playing different roles. And I said, it's this is going to be a challenge for Fisher. And, sure and they lost. And Caleb first had to play a lot more. Yes. And he's it at was. this and stage. More. At this stage, he's not ready to do that. Next year, probably, nope. but now, no. No, it's 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 a challenge. I hope we can get it right. I mean, there's the problem is you know when you have something that is so valuable like college basketball, mm-hmm. the bureaucracy really flexes its muscles. And I wish that there were just more rational heads that say, look, I'm, I don't care, you know, about the political side of, of the, the sport. I just want to see the sport grow. Yes. I want to see the sport be better. Yep. Uh, I want better rules, uh, the rules that allow the game to be played the way the game is being played anyway. Right. You know, and, and it's not it doesn't mean let's make the game the NBA. It's not the NBA because our players aren't that good. Let's be honest. <laughs> right. You know, but we should have a, a, a you know, international rules. Should, should flow to the college game. You know, a wider lane, extend the restricted arc out further, more plays at the rim, allow guys to take the ball off the rim, a live ball off the rim. I think it's terrific for the game. It creates flow. Yep. It creates more scoring opportunities. You know, but again, pull that restricted arc out and play to that right to verticality, which is so key. I think that's helped the game. Let's play to it. Uh, but instead, you put a restricted arc two feet away from the basket where someone like myself or my brother could dunk from there. Yeah, like you're talking about elite level athletes. Widen yeah. the lane, extend the restricted arc, more plays at the rim, better flow, and six fouls, so you're not taking the best players off the floor for for what could be a questionable call. Yeah, I mean Brandon Watkins could dunk from there. No, I'm just kidding. You're right. You are right. <laughs> <laughs> I just everybody, people going back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Younger people like who? Who? Okay. Hey, hey Steve. I did that game at Penn State. It was a Michigan game. Oh, I know. I, I couldn't and get down to see behind, it. I know, but I, and I didn't make it to shoot around because I was doing radio. But right. the kids behind me are saying, hey, we need a, we need another one of those 2001 batters up. And I go, hang on a second. I said, what year are you guys? I'm a senior. And I go, what, when were you born? 99. <laughs> You're a senior in college, and you were born in 99. Like, yeah. you were barely alive when I, I know. was playing. Oh, wow. That's where we're yeah. at. Oh, that's, that's all right. Yeah. I, I told the story today to my class. I, you know, so I asked each person in class because the play-by-play project's their next one. So I said, yep. you know, so I asked who's done play-by-play, and there's like four kids put their hands up. So I asked about their first experience. So then one of them asked me, well, what date was your first experience? I said, De- December 8th. <laughs> I said, December 8th, 1977. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and they're like, my dad wasn't even born in 77. That's pretty much what you're dealing with. Thank you very much. <laughs> yep. 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 I, I prefer to think of myself as experienced. John. Yes. Seasoned. <laughs> seasoned. Very seasoned. My friend, thanks so much. Great that you're in demand. You should be. You're, yes. you're, you're awesome at it. So. 
I appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's good to be working. Good to be around the game. Yeah, it's, you, you, honestly, it's, it's a pleasure. It's great to have you with us, brother. Appreciate it so much. Thanks, man. All right. Thank you. See you, John.